Hey there, welcome back to Work-Life Harmony. My name is Megan Sumrall. I'm a time management expert. And today I am bringing a guest on for you to talk about one of my absolute favorite things in the world, sleep. Oh my goodness, do I love sleep. Now I'm on a mission to bring work-life harmony into homes all over the world through all things time management, organization, and productivity. And when it comes to productivity, the number one thing that you can do to support that is to sleep well and sleep often. And this is why I'm bringing a guest on today from the Better Sleep Council here to give us some amazing tips and strategies around uh, how to improve our sleep, how to help young ones with sleep, and what the real benefits are here. So I'm really excited to have you here and to introduce Terry to you. So let's go ahead and get started. Hey everyone, welcome back to Work Life Harmony. I have a new guest here that I'm really excited about because uh, Terry Crawley is going to have a conversation with us about one of my most favorite things, probably one of my top two favorite things, which is sleep. I love sleep. I love everything about sleep. I love Jamie's bed, all of it. Um, but what we're going to be talking about today in her real zone of genius here being on the Better Sleep Council is in the relationship of sleep and productivity, along with what do we do when we're not getting good sleep to help that. So welcome to the show, Terry. I'd love to have you introduce yourself, um, let everyone know where you're from and how you got involved in this line of work. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me, Megan. I am here um, with uh, representing the Better Sleep Council. And as a registered nurse, I fell into sleep quite uh, by accident many years ago and have been just fascinated mm -hmm. by this whole um, uh, field that I'm in that's exciting with new research being done constantly and the benefits of sleep. I cannot tell you how many wonderful benefits there are and why it's so important. So thank you for having me. You are so welcome. And I love that, you know, when we were talking, it was understanding the relationship of really good sleep and productivity, which is what I really want to talk about today. But if you're new here to the podcast, I want to pause for a second and make sure you understand what I'm talking about when I say productivity. It's not about getting more done than your neighbor. It's not about making a long checklist and getting them all done. Uh, the way we look at productivity here on the show is saying getting the things that are most important to you done in a stress-free way. Right. I mean, that's really what it's about at the end of the day, wrapping up our days and weeks and going, all right, the stuff that that I said was important, I got it done and I got it done without being stressed out the entire time. So I just kind of wanted to put that frame of reference in uh, for anyone new to the show. So I would love for you to help us understand what you all have seen here. What is that relationship? between sleep and productivity? And is there a magic number of hours that we all need to be getting <laughs> in sleep each night? There is a, a, a number of range that's for adults at seven to nine hours. And mm -hmm. I know that kind of um, bothers people. You know, I, I think I run into in, in all of my work uh, with uh, with uh, broadcasting the benefits and, and the importance of sleep. I find people saying that's not realistic. I don't have time for that. So we get back mm -hmm. into that productivity conversation that you just started, which I, I love to talk about and, and tease out a little bit because we are so much more productive when we're well rested. And I think many people make um, the error of trading sleep hours for wake hours. You know, we we, we want to give up sleep so we can be wake, awake longer and get more done. And that is a horrible formula and it doesn't work that way. Um, we have to flip the script and put sleep first. And when we get that seven to nine hours of quality, uninterrupted sleep every 24 hours, we're doing better. We get, we're more efficient. We get more done. We're more um, accurate. We're um, more on task. We're more focused. We have a better outlook. We're thinking more clearly. We're using better judgment, better problem solving ability. And one of the most important things to really understand about sufficient sleep, it's, um, how it gives us resilience. So when you bring up the word stress, um, one of the most important things we can do to make us more resilient and to really be in a lesser stress or stress-free state or just understanding that we can handle what life throws at us is sufficient sleep gives us that ability. And I think that's something that people don't understand. It's so much more than being sleepy or feeling like you're dragging. Um, sleep deprivation really affects us 
physically, but mentally as well in, in so many ways. So I think yeah. that's something important to think about. And really, can we restructure, re-engineer our days to put sleep first and then see how much more productive, happy um, that that we are when we do that? And I, I find very few people, if I challenge them to two weeks of making sure you get that sleep, if you haven't been doing that, they feel so much better and they get their point of reference back that they rarely go back to putting sleep sort of in a, in the back burner. Yeah. You brought up a couple things that I think are so subtle, but so powerful on, on some of the benefits of that sleep. One being the efficiency of our time. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the other, just more clarity of thought, which is going to mean that what you're doing is of a higher quality. So then maybe you're not having to waste time by going back and fixing and redoing some of the things that you were doing when you're sleep deprived. I was recently being interviewed um, on a, for a business uh, show and it was an, you know, show all about entrepreneurs. And so one of the questions they always ask is how many hours of sleep do you get at night? And so he asked me that question and I said eight to nine and he was stunned because he's mm -hmm. like, I never talk to entrepreneurs that say they're getting eight to nine hours of sleep. And what you just said, I think that was a big reality check for me or my aha moment. People often ask, how do I get as much done in the small pockets of time that I do work every day. And mm -hmm. a big part of it is my planning and how I plan and manage my time. But I believe a second part of that is because I'm so rested, I can crank out a lot of stuff in small pockets of right. time. And it, and it comes, it's not hard when I'm rested. Exactly. And unfortunately it's a very ubiquitous mindset mm -hmm. that we we have glamorized and idealized people who say, I don't get much sleep and look how much I'm getting done. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it's, it's a horrible shame that that occurs because we have to look at sleep as it, as it is, because it's a biological requirement. Mm -hmm. Megan, neither one of us would say, oh, I've learned how to get through the day with drinking no water. Uh, I've learned how I've gotten used to it. I don't need water or or very much of it. Or, you know, I, I've learned how to not eat. I mean, you know, these are biological requirements right. that we have to, you know, that that are it's a reality. And I think that we are really, I, I mean, shining a bright light on that fallacy, that that and, and that trap we fall into. It doesn't make you a stronger person because right. you need less sleep. You're not right. Yeah. Um, and I noticed just last night or just yesterday, the night before, it was a very rare night where I did not get much sleep. I was mm -hmm. on on a trip out with girlfriends, we intentionally chose to stay up late and then I had to get up very early. So I was functioning on just under six hours of sleep, which is never my norm. Right. And when I look back at my day yesterday, mm -hmm. I, I did nothing of value. Um, mm -hmm. I was very short, very mm -hmm. easily set off by family, right. very irritable. What are some of the other common things or behaviors that you see in people when they are not, not well rested? I think there's a, a lot of things that people don't realize are, are tied to sleep. Um, in, in a patient care scenario, this was so interesting. A fairly young mother of, of three little kids um, came to our clinic. Oh, they're getting tons of sleep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. And she um, had had a lot of symptoms and her husband dragged her to our clinic, um, kicking and screaming because there was some snoring and things going on at night and, and um, very fitful sleeping that he reported. And, and she was sort of, you know, dismissive and well, I'm busy. And of course I'm not getting enough sleep. I've got all this stuff going on. Right. And, and the short of the story is the, the point is she ended up having sleep apnea that had been undiagnosed and of course non-treated. So we diagnosed her, we got her treated for sleep apnea and her first follow-up visit, her husband's first words at that second appointment, he said, thank you for giving me my wife back. Mm -hmm. So yeah. because of the person I felt this changes, morning, I was like, oh my God, I'm back. Like it's me again. Yes. <laughs> I mean, think about these things in terms of being a partner, being a parent. Um, gosh, when people, the mood, oh, the mood changes in people uh, are, are profound and can be the irritability, um, lack of an ability to problem solve, being very disorganized, um, not being able to keep a nice environment, keeping things clutter-free. We can't make good decisions 
when we're we're tired. We don't get things done, just as you illustrated on one day. But think there are too many people that that's sort of their thing, and it's it's a constant uphill battle to get things done. Um, even things like job satisfaction, we some research has shown that that is uh, degraded when you're uh, you know sleep deprived. So. So if that's a chronic situation of sleep deprivation, you're less likely to enjoy your work. You're less uh-huh. likely to be patient with your children. You're less likely. That's me. <laughs> that's the first thing that goes for me is my Yeah. Patient. So I, I think if, if anything, sort of open up your, your listeners, we, we should open up our eyes to what, what is impacted by sleep. Mm-hmm. And the short answer is everything. And, and, and I think that's sort of a disconnect. And, and of course, when we're sleep deprived, here's another problem. We lack insight. So sleep deprivation really and does a number good of decision making skills, yeah. right? Yes. Like all of that, like you wake up already yeah. in a state of decision fatigue if you yes. are not well right. rested. Yeah. So you're not planning and you're yeah. not getting organized and you're not sort of making important decisions in, in the order they should be made, all of that. Mm-hmm. And that's everything, whether it comes to how you structure your day in terms of work, family obligations, but even in, in what you choose to eat. We sure. find that yeah. sleep deprived people are grabbing terrible food choices, you know, they're reaching Again, for decision donuts. fatigue, willpower is yep. out the window. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They're reaching for high fat, high sugar foods to give them that burst of energy or, mm-hmm. or consuming lots of caffeine to get through the day. Now here's where this horrible, vicious cycle starts because then the, the bad food during the day and the lots of caffeine lead to a horrible night of sleep. Yeah. So, so we've got, you know, you've got to break the cycle. And I think the only way to do that is to just take a moment, sit back and say, you know, really, how am I doing? And and am I getting the sleep I need? And could my life be a lot different? Because we do find people that really get it, get it. And, and, and I think the quality of life, the potential for really increasing that is tremendous. And we just can't overlook that. So I really can't overstate the importance of, no, I agree. Now, assessing what do we do when you know a lot of our listeners um are in a stage of life where they may be in the trenches with littles who are coming in you know particularly if you have multiple kids and it's like each night is almost a game of whack-a-mole with different kids coming up waking up in the middle of the night a sick child all of that any suggestions for the women in that stage of life where they they would love to get a good night's sleep? They're doing everything right. They're going to bed, you know, they're, right. they're not trying to shortchange it, but the reality of their life is one where their sleep is very disrupted um, on a regular basis. Absolutely. And and for your listeners, uh, you can they can always go back to the Better Sleep Council website for a lot of these points I'm bringing up oh, if right. they need to refresh, you know, or sit down. But the, I think the very first rule of thumb is talk about sleep with young children. I mean, bring up the conversation early and often because sleep is the number one health habit. And and it's clearly in that order, it comes first because diet and exercise are completely dependent upon sufficient sleep. So it's that important. So we have to start that conversation early and and bring it up often. And during the daytime, when not, when people aren't tired and, and sleep deprived. So that that's important. I mean, look, we get little kids to brush their teeth every night. Do they really understand cavities and things? Probably not. But you know what? We started early. It became a health habit. It's a non-negotiable health habit. So let's get that message across. And that's a hard, that's, that's a tall order because so many grownups never got the message. So I'm asking grownups to give that. And, and that can be hard because Think about it. Kids are completely dependent on grownups to get the sleep they need every night. Right. So here's one of the most important things grownups and kids can do to get sufficient sleep. And that is to have that bedtime routine. We need a time in the evening where we transition our minds and bodies uh, from wake to sleep. And it's crucially important to have it have it in the same steps every night, go through the same steps in the same order, make it relaxing. Um, Don't lose your cool. You got it. You got to make 
it, it a positive thing. Um, right. and, and of course, if you're tired, it's hard to do that. I mean, we're all short of, of patients when, when we're tired. So, but we've got to make that pleasant. We've got to make it so kids don't see it as a, you know, major timeout. Um, because in their little minds, that's what it can be, or, you know, yeah. we're saying here, let's get ready to go away from your toys, families, and friends for, uh, 10, 12 hours, depending on their age, however much sleep they need um, and, and give it up. But let's make it pleasant. Let's make it a time for bonding. Let's approach it in a different light. Never, and, and while I'm on the topic, don't use the bedroom as a timeout. Don't use going to bed early as okay. a punishment. Don't make staying up late as a reward. I mean, careful to do that, but always bring up the benefits of sleep, make the routine as fun as possible. And also give children, even young children, it'll vary with age, but give them choices in the process that they have little choice. They will become more able to self-manage and they'll become more empowered. Even if it's something simple, like you pick out the pajamas, right. you, you pick the book choose we're going to read, book, yeah. right? Or you choose my pajamas for tonight. I mean, you've got to, this has got to be a positive bonding experience. And always, I always say, um, when you go through the routine, even with little kids, kids with um, developmental um, problems, have a pic pictorial up on the wall that they can follow surprisingly enough, kids like structure. They oh, yes. feel more secure, but there have been excellent studies showing that when you institute and stick to that routine every night and you approach it in a positive, calm, matter of fact way, even there's that bedtime resistance, um, but that it's a non-negotiable thing. Kids Kids can fall into line and actually look forward to it and, and you will get them to stay, you know, get to bed. And the goal is to get to bed on time and yeah. stay in bed. Yeah. It's funny. One of the things I can remember my husband and I did way back when, you know, she was little, little, um, we were very, just because I, I love my sleep so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. We were very structured and routine with bedtime and all of that to the point that I know maybe some external folks would get annoyed on how we're like, no, we can't do that because it's going to impact bedtime. But if we had gone through a couple nights where maybe, you know, our daughter wasn't feeling well or something. Mm -hmm. So there was a legit reason to get me up in the middle of the night. If it had happened more than two or three nights in a row, we would sit down and say, okay, now like tonight I'm I'm off duty. You're on duty. Right. So at tuck in time, we would say, if you need, if there's any emergency tonight, right. tonight, you go to dad's side of the bed. Exactly. Um, and, and so and, at yeah. least we could, one, it would break the habit if she was just in a, I just want to get mom up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but then if there really was a need, then I would get a night of, of good rest while he would get up and handle any emergencies there. And I think that's something that's important for for people to discuss, you know, if you do have two parents in the home to, to take right. turns doing that. So everybody gets a, a exactly. night of good sleep. Yeah, exactly. And, and be very self-aware of how, how you're approaching or presenting sleep and bedtime to a child. Be very, very sure to celebrate successes. Mm -hmm. I cannot emphasize that enough in the morning when the, when your child has gone to bed on time with very little resistance, um, really celebrate as best, you know, stickers, they love the stickers. You know, you get to put your sticker up if you stay. My in daughter bed. just wanted me to climb into bed and snuggle in the morning. Exactly. And that was her exactly. like, big thing. So yeah. And, and all I know a lot of children love to do the three three good things. We we call that the three good things they can do at bedtime. You either write them out depending on their age or list them or just say, what are the best, you know, three good things that happened to you today? You know, it just sometimes gets into a little bit of serenity and a feel good when you're going off to sleep. When you think about night lights, use amber colored night lights instead of the bright white. And you can gradually, if, if the child needs it close to the head of the bed, we want to avoid too much light of any kind. Of course, we sleep better in the darkest environment possible, but gradually move it away. And don't dismiss the sleep surface um, for children. I, it's very, it's vitally important for everyone of all ages, but that sleep environment and that sleep surface, you know, are there a lot of um, the surface? Is it a old use mattress for the child that, you know, maybe needs another thing. Empower them during the day. Can 
at, at an appropriate age, you get to pick out your pillow because sleep is so important. And we go over the benefits of sleep while we're pillow shopping or, you know, blanket shopping, you know, how about that transitional object that they feel secure with and, mm -hmm. and make sure that Better Sleep Council has great re uh, resources on selecting a mattress and, and all, all things mattress related and think about the environment. Um, Grownups and kids, is it cluttered? Is it filled with toys? Or these are visual, visual distractions. And these actually can impact how soundly we sleep, how, how you know, quickly we fall asleep and stay asleep. Is there a lot of chaos and clutter and, and stuff? I mean, keep the rooms, everyone's bedroom and sleep area should be as minimalist, you know, as possible and, and serene as possible. And that goes for decor. And what's in that room? Are there, you know, I've, I've talked to grownups who say as soon as they got the um, exercise equipment out of the room, they slept better Just, because, you know, on some yeah, level, sure. it's a yeah. distraction Yeah. And, and the neater it is and close those closet doors, get the unfolded laundry, set it out in the hall at night, anything just to make that room, you know, pleasing, relaxing and quiet. Because, I mean, we, especially when it comes to falling asleep, I know a lot of your listeners and all of us, when we feel overwhelmed, the second our head hits the pillows, oh my God, our minds start all the racing. Minds, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we're like thinking of everything that needs to be done. So that's where the environment comes in, mm -hmm. serene um, and, and not too busy. But that's also something that prompts me to tell, um, to recommend making a list um, at the end of the workday. Yeah, and doing break, that, kind of brain dump everything out. It does. And that even that the act of handwriting it, it down and looking at it on a piece of paper, all of a sudden, Megan, things can look a lot more manageable, yeah. a lot less and for like, those, overwhelming. You know, for folks listening who've been through the top program that are, you know, mastering weekly planning, you get that as a benefit when you do your weekly planning. So rather than, you know, when you're when you've really mastered weekly planning, now I don't have, need to make a list at night, but I go look at my plan so I can say, okay, here's what's on the, here's what's on the sure. agenda for tomorrow. I can rest knowing I've got a plan in place. Uh, right. So if you are, you know, new to planning and don't have this yet, definitely doing that brained up at night recommend if you're already mastering weekly planning, just do a quick review of your plan for the next mm -hmm. day uh, really helps clear your brain. Now these are, it's got me thinking about some stuff. I feel like for people that are you know, struggling with good sleep and we're adults, it's almost like going back to parenting ourselves mm -hmm. and setting up those routines for ourselves as we would our little, our young children in terms of those routines for bedtime and all of that. You've yeah. mentioned a website a few times. Where can people go to really read up on some resources to help them with better sleep? Sure. Bettersleep.org. Okay. It's the Better Sleep Council's website. And Perfect. there's just lots of helpful information. And I, it's it's a fun, I mean, great website in terms of great things to talk about, even with your kids. Um, and make it a daytime thing where you really approach the whole concept of, of this is the most important health habit we can master. This can be really make a difference in, in all of our lives. And, mm -hmm. and if you really want... Um, a better life, a better quality life, and um, to do better in, in all aspects. It's it's time that we sort of stop that, you know, looking at sleep as a as a time waster or something that if the we last get thing to prioritize. Sleep, yeah, we don't we lack the work ethic or we're not ambitious right. or we're not. I mean, really turn that around and say, you know what, getting sufficient sleep is the most responsible thing. Mm -hmm we can all do. And I would be very unapologetic for your need for sleep. And, and you know, feel very really, validated. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I mean, it's a top priority. And, you know, just discussing if, if parents take, you know, one night where they don't get much sleep. I mean, look at naps as a naps are a great way to um, make up some sleep if it's really starting to to hurt your day and you're not feeling good. And I, um, one of my most important tips that I give people, please don't drive drowsy. I hate the term drowsy driving. It sounds so benign, but it is as dangerous as sure. drunk driving. And that's something when we think about trying to power through sleep deprivation, first of all, don't do that. It, it, make that a priority. But if you are sleep deprived, make sure you've got someone else driving. Um, it's, it's a very dangerous thing. And that's 
something to keep it top of mind. So good. I can't thank you enough for being here. We appreciate it. Hopefully all of our listeners will be able to go head over to bettersleep.org, correct? And we'll have that link in the show notes as well. Um, And maybe start reframing, just start with reframing your relationship with sleep. And, you know, if, if you're someone that's not getting enough sleep, start there and looking at it as the number one thing that you can do for your overall wellness and health. So thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Megan. My pleasure.